afternoon and welcome to our last lecture in the Armenian Studies Lecture Series for the year. Um, it is very fortuitous to have Ur Umit Ungur close off our uh, lecture series. It is um, Ur himself is, as a name, is one that brings good fortune. Um, so thank you for coming and accepting our invitation. Ur um, Uit Ungur is a product of a new generation of scholars emerging from Turkey who deal unabashedly with the Armenian Genocide. A book on the Holocaust by Yehuda Bauer, Rethinking the Holocaust, sparked Ur's interest in the Armenian Genocide. Despite his origins from the same region uh, where the genocide occurred, Ur um, said in an interview, I had never heard about such an event and it sparked my curiosity. When I did my research, I was amazed by the difference between the denials of official histories in Turkey versus what the ordinary population in Eastern Turkey knew about the genocide. Today, Ur has made this curiosity his profession. He is an assistant professor at the Department of History at Utrecht University in the Netherlands and a researcher at the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies in Amsterdam. Interest is historical sociology. He published his doctoral thesis as his first book, um, The Making of Modern Turkey, Nation and State in Eastern Anatolia between 1930 and 1950 with Oxford University Press. In this book, he examines the processes of social engineering, the Young Turks and the Republican successors engaged to create a failed homogeneous Turkey, including the use of mass violence and genocide against Armenians and Kurds. Ur focuses on events in the province of Fyodorabakht to illustrate the process of state formation um, and nation formation. A spin-off, as he says himself, he likes to use this word, um, of his first book is a volume, Confiscation and Destruction, The Young Turk Seizure of Armenian Property, published in 2011 too, and co-authored with Mehmet Polaten. Their book examines how Turkish economic nationalism led to the confiscation of Armenian wealth and property and the ways in which the proceeds were distributed. He moves from the macro level to a really detailed provincial study, in this case both of Adana and Diyarbakir. The role of local elites, their relationship with central authorities, and the participation of ordinary Turks in the plunder and distribution are unearthed. His current research, which we will he hear a bit of this afternoon, examines the relationship between organized crime and political violence. On the surface, civil wars seem like ethnic conflicts between collective groups. But recent research demonstrates that much more complex and ambiguous processes are at play between local actors, civilians, and armies. The cases who we will be considering today range from the Balkans to Anatolia and the Caucasus. We will hear about how a transnational analysis offers fresh insights into the working of states under duress and the phenomena of mass violence. Please join me in welcoming Wurundi. I'd like to start out today by, uh, by pointing out that my research and my talk today, as it uh, concludes the, uh, the lecture series of the ASP, uh, that I, I would like to end on a note of uh, problematization or a question, a series of questions uh, framed through this um, a juxtaposition of three separate um, uh, episodes of mass violence. And this begins, of course, uh, with one of the, well, uh, uh, if not the most characteristic problem of, the, of this year, the centenary uh, of the First World War. This year we mark uh, Europe, United States, Canada, Australia, but also in Turkey, uh, marks the, the centenary of the First World War. But if we look at uh, publications in the newspapers, and a recently very interesting booklet came out by the British Council, uh, what does the British audience, or the British public know of the First World War, then this is still a relatively uh, Western Eurocentric uh, 
um, geographically, but also it's centered very much around war between armies, rather than what I will be speaking of today, and my talk indeed departs from these uh, relatively narrow, narrowly constructed First World War histories that focus, A, first of all, too much on the period between 1914 and 1918, strictly, which was, of course, you know, the fronts and the wars uh, in Western Europe, um, and secondly, too much on violence between, between standing armies, so war rather than violence uh, by armies or paramilitary forces towards civilians. And this is, I think, the central two problematizations. I don't have all the answers here, but problematizations that I'd like to uh, present to you um, um, in three ways. My, my talk today is structured in three uh, separate but interrelated parts. So first I'd like to discuss exactly um, how during the Balkan Wars, First and Second Balkan Wars, mass violence against civilians was conducted. Then I'll move on to a discussion of uh, war and genocide uh, in the Ottoman Empire, especially in Anatolia, but not exclusively in Anatolia. And finally, I'll end with, in the third part of my talk, uh, by moving to the Caucasus. So we, uh, what we'll be doing is gradually moving eastward. And my central question is, how can we best contextualize these three seemingly unrelated, separate, disparate events? Um, how are these conflicts related, if at all? Was the, f the First World War uh, a central part of a much wider context of mass violence? And if so, how? Now, the title of my talk is taken from um, a Turkish language book published um, quite a while ago, I think in the 1980s, by a man called Ismet Görgülü, who was a, a historian of um, the, the Ottoman army, and he published a book on Yıllık Harbin Kadrosu, in which he talks about Tur Turkey and the uh, Turkey's engagement in war between 1912, roughly 1911, to 1922. But uh, uh, it's mostly a compendium. It, it, it hardly an uh, provides an analysis exactly why then does he use this decade of war, this 10 years war uh, of the Ottoman Empire. I'd like to take that up a little bit and move it forward. Um, so this is a rather comprehensive, uh, synthetic, att well, attempt at uh, synthesis uh, that will depart from a historiography that studies these acts of violence mostly separately. Um, as a matter of fact, the only book that I know that not only contextualizes these three episodes, but also focuses specifically on mass violence against civilians is uh, by Alan Kramer in his excellent book, Dynamic of Destruction, which has a, a chapter on mass violence against civilians, uh, but it hasn't really been properly explored yet. So let me begin with the first, the first part, the Balkan Wars. Now, here's a map of the territories involved. What we see in the Balkan Wars, there are two separate Balkan Wars, October 1912, uh, and then uh, there's a, a lull in the fighting, and then the second Balkan War ends in May 1913. Um, there are several vectors of violence. In the first Balkan Wars, we see a, a certain ganging up of the Balkan League against the Ottoman Empire by the separate Balkan nations. And in the second Balkan War, we see a certain infighting. So Greece turns against Bulgaria, um, Bulgaria against Romania, Ser Serbia against Bulgaria, and Serbia against Albania. But what is important is that the Ottoman Empire in this territory fought 14 battles, and it lost them all except for one, which was a stalemate, um, and w a very rapid incapacitation of the Ottoman army. Now, the map of Southeast Europe since then changed forever and roughly established the uh, borders that we, that we see on the European map today. Um, there was a clear distinction in these wars between combatants and non-combatants. It was entirely clear who were the soldiers and who were the civilians, but none of the armies respected this distinction. And I'd like to touch on five forms of violence against civilians that uh, were carried out during the, the Balkan Wars. Now, first of all, I'll start with the least violent, if you will, the least bloody, if you will, which is forced conversion. During the Balkan Wars, there was a widespread forced conversion um, of 
civilians. The major religious conflict was, of course, between Greece and Bulgaria because of the Bulgarian exarchate. Uh, but mainly it was hybrid minorities, such as the Pomaks, uh, who suffered uh, frontal cultural assaults. Um, for example, the Bulgarian army, the exarchate, tried to convert the roughly 80,000 Pomaks living in Bulgaria, uh, convert them uh, to away from Islam into Christianity. Uh, the military and civil authorities supported this campaign and, and so did most nationalist intellectuals. So how, how does this happen? Well, very simply, a, a gendarmerie commander together with a priest walk into a village. They point the gun at the village elder and they will say, you're all baptized now, uh, from now on you'll, you'll, be, uh, you'll be Christians. The mosque would very often be demolished or turned into a church. And that was the end of it. And this was seen as a form of reconversion. So the Pomaks, they, were, they became Muslims in the, let's say, in the 17th century before, and now th th this was simply a, a revision. Now, I think there are three aspects that are important about this, this campaign. First of all, the importance of religious identity rather than ethnic identity, and the weakness of biological racist thought. Because one would argue that an enemy outgroup cannot become part of the in-group, but in this case, uh, this is an exception. Um, Secondly, also quite important, we see a certain policy of nationalization in newly acquired regions, regions that were demographically not, uh, didn't belong to the, to the nominal nation and had to be, quote unquote, nationalized. So you see Serbianization, uh, Hellenization, etc. And finally, the cultural prohibition on media, on religious freedoms, um, on a massive scale. For example, the first thing the Greek army did when they entered Salonika was uh, prohibit um, expressions of non-Greek culture. Now, so far, this was still relatively, um, not benign, but a certain absence of physical violence. But as the Balkan Wars grew on, as they uh, dragged on, we see a certain radicalization of the violence against civilians. And probably the characteristic form of violence against civilians was expulsion, or which is called a very ethnic very ugly term, ethnic cleansing. It's a perpetrator concept. I don't think we should use it uh, analytically. Uh, but expulsion became a metaphor for the Balkans in general for the, in the 20th century. And it had uh, two, uh, two important dimensions. First of all, its objective. It was a very clear ideological objective of uh, generating a, ho a homogeneous nation state, an idea that was shared by all of the Balkan League countries. Least, of course, by the uh, by the then Ottoman rulers, uh, because the Ottoman Empire was multi-ethnic uh, and there were ethnic Bulgarians and Greeks fighting in the Ottoman army. Secondly, the forms of expulsion, also very important. On the one hand, there was voluntary migration to the Ottoman Empire of Muslims, but of course this voluntariness is high, highly disputed. If you, people are fleeing from a war zone, you can hardly call that voluntary. But there was also very clear forced expulsion people kicked off their land and expelled. Uh, and you know, where they would go, it was pretty clear, generally uh, uh, Turkey or the Ottoman Empire. I'll get to that in the next slide. And also very interestingly, on the one hand, there was unilateral. So an army would occupy the territory and expel the civilians unilaterally. But what we see in the Balkan Wars is a certain new state system in which um, uh, uh, states uh, begin um, this certain expulsion process multilaterally. So the Greek and the Bulgarian government, for example, it exchanged each other's minorities. And this is quite, um, quite interesting. In 1913, there are agreements from mutual population exchange. So the concept of population exchange um, becomes relevant. What happened to, the, to these? Oh, this is a very interesting um, propaganda poster, by the way. You see that uh, there's a Bulgarian um, ar ar army officer standing under the gate of Europe and he's expelling this Abdi Baba and Fatima Khanum. Uh, you see the Orientalist depictions of Muslims in this, uh, in this slide, um, and a certain notion of uh, a civilizing process at the gates of Europe. Can we, do you want to ask the questions now? We're expelled from heaven, Israya. Yeah. Um, what happened to these, to these uh, Refugees. Well, the largest group of refugees uh, were the Ottoman Muslims, 
of all groups that were particularly vulnerable because the Ottoman state protection evaporated and what came in instead was, um, was nationalist uh, policy homogenization uh, by the Serbian, Bulgarian, Greek governments in various forms um, and phases. What is also important that uh, in most of the newly expanded Balkan countries, they were not treated as citizens. Best example is the Serbian uh, occupied uh, territory. The Serbian government issued uh, a decree that the new territories were not, did not um, um, fall under the, the rule of law and the constitution. So there's no real protection. The result was mass flight and expulsion, as you can see on this photo uh, of a, a Danish doctor. Um, these people packed on the way to Istanbul. Istanbul at this period was bursting with refugees. There were some philanthropic associations that tried to mitigate this massive uh, demographic and social crisis. It was a moral crisis. Um, but of course, this was uh, relatively difficult. The extent of the catastrophe uh, was uh, simply overwhelmed the government. The government was overstretched in uh, attempting to cope with this. Now, there's one kind of sub-theme in this field of uh, Balkan war studies that I'd like to touch upon, which follows from this, these refugees, and which is what I call VIP refugees. Uh, the effect on the young Turk elite in particular was formidable. The families of the young Turks were overrepresented among the refugees. The young Turk leadership, if you study their biographies, and I've tried to do so in my, uh, in my book, the, the Making of Modern Turkey, by looking exactly who these people are and you know, how did the trajectory of their life uh, affect their politics. What we see is that they predominantly originated from three areas, from Salonika, from what is now the Republic of Macedonia, and third, from Kosovo, which were now under Greek and Serbian rule. So famous young Turks, such as um, well, Javit Bey, Talat Bey, Bahattin Shakir also here, but also Mustafa Kemal's mother became uh, refugees. One of these refugees, a most interesting person, which still deserves a proper biography, was Dr. Mehmet Nazim. Now, this man was, uh, was a longtime member of uh, the Committee of Union and Progress. He was the director of the hospital in the city, and he was a, well, he came from a relatively famous and influential Family, a sabotized family in Salonika. Um, he, ran a, uh, he ran a hospital and his, his, his family uh, ran several successful businesses in the city. And then the war comes. In October 1912, the Greek army occupies uh, or conquers Salonika and jails him without due process for about a year. They send him to prison in Athens where he is tortured. Uh, he is vexed, by, for example, uh, you know, we exterminate your family. The Greek flag is hanging over Constantinopolis, and these kinds of um, uh, uh, yeah, these kind of ideas of torture and, and bullying. Uh, he was ultimately exchanged for, uh, I think, some Greek uh, prisoners of the Young Turk regime, and then he ended up in Smyrna, in Izmir. Uh, and what this is important because what we see from his writings is that the, the idea of exile, of being expelled from the city. Uh, that he would, which he loved, and he, he basically knew nothing else, um, deeply, deeply upset him. The site was hapless family, powerful, rich in Salonika, uh, and then reduced to destitution in Izmir. Uh, this victimization uh, deeply radicalized him, and he began writing newspaper articles, uh, publicizing the Bulgarian Greek atrocities against Muslims, and calling for revenge against the remaining Ottoman Christians, because he ended up in Smyrna, Izmir, where there's a middle class, upper middle class, and upper class um, Greek and Armenian presence. And this is something that was unbearable to him. Now, uh, we know what happened afterwards. He became a major architect, organizer of the Armenian Genocide, 1915. And um, after the establishment of the Turkish Republic, he um, was executed uh, in the political show trials for plotting against Kemal Ataturk. And there are many others. Now, the third form of violence during the Balkan Wars was sexual violence. Uh, as in many wars, or civil wars, we see that this is, uh, was not policy like it was in the recent war in Bosnia, uh, but due to, a, on the one hand, a breakdown of discipline, and on the other hand, a certain dual track uh, 
process with the army on the one hand and paramilitaries. This is where my ongoing research comes into being paramilitaries who were beyond or above the law. They, were, um, they received impunity on a massive scale, even though the rapes were reported back to Bulgarian army or the Bulgarian um, uh, civilian authorities, we see um, sexual violence on a massive scale. And the fourth form of violence were massacres. What we see also, as I said, clear, clear distinctions between combatants and non-combatants, but we see mass, violent, mass killing of civilians. A lots, of, um, lots of it actually. Atrocities were committed by all sides to varying d degrees in the Balkan Wars, but it was especially the Bulgarian army uh, in various different publications in, in the period, also in the recent research, that was accused of systematic maltreatment of civilian populations. Uh, this included uh, arson of villages, large-scale destruction of villages, beatings and torture and, ma and massacres, mostly of Greeks, but especially of quote-unquote Turks, Ottoman Muslims. Only on the 13th of December 1912, so this is al almost a full two months after the war, did the Bulgarian High Command issue an order not um, that, uh, prohibiting violence against civilians. And it was the man on the left, Ratko Dimitriev, the general who uh, was accused especially by somebody like uh, Leon Trotsky, who was the, um, he was a uh, correspondent for the newspaper Kievskaya Mussel, um, that this man was, and I quote from Trotsky, quote, a man deeply animated by those features of careerism, including careless zeal and moral cynicism, end of quote. It's almost as if Trotsky is talking about himself, of course, but that's beside the point. Um, why did this happen? On the one hand, we see this is a very clear instrumental uh, the function of, of, the, of the massacres. Right? So um, during, the, during, the, during the Balkan Wars, but also later, it was blamed on you know, Balkan men with large mustaches or uh, Eastern barbarism, you know, these kinds of uh, uh, Balkanist or Orientalist depictions, but very clear instrumental rationale behind it, deliberate, calculated terror, was intended to spur, to move populations out of a particular piece of territory. So a very clear function. Secondly, it was a reaction to stiff resistance by guerrilla groups. Uh, some Albanians, for example, put up some stiff resistance and this was a way of overcoming this, um, uh, this resistance. We also see cruelty, taking trophies from bodies reported widely by British nurses, for example, um, uh, Edith Durham, a very famous uh, British nurse who published a memoir, um, and onwards from there. What is also interesting is that we see during the propaganda posters published, for example, by the Greeks, the, by the Greek government, we see that massacre is actually celebrated. Right? So it's not uh, something to be ashamed of, something to be uh, masked or camouflaged, but we see clearly a, a destroyed mosque in the back and then a, a, a number of dead victims. Um, the best example of, uh, of this, uh, this stiff resistance and massacres against civilians was the town of Berane, which is um, it's, it's a, st a strategic border town in Montenegro. The front during the wars went back and forth a couple of times, and particularly stiff resistance by the Albanian um, population until it fell and the Montenegrin army finally overran it and murdered approximately 1,700 civil uh, civilians. And finally, we have destruction of material culture. Uh, mosques, or Islam in general, were, were particularly hated objects of Ottoman hegemony in the Balkans. And we see, especially by the Serbian and Bulgarian armies, quite systematic raising uh, of mosques. And this had two, two functions. On the one hand, creating continuity with the past, so de-Ottomanizing the, the past of the Balkans, creating continuity, and secondly, the survivors have nothing to return to because community life has, uh, has been made uh, impossible. Here's the, uh, the mosque in the town of Bioce, which was renovated in 2013 um, in a, I would say, somewhat similar state. Um, this brings me to the second part of my talk. Um, the First World War, so far, has been studied relatively in isolation from the Balkan Wars. 
There's only been one or two colleagues who've written about the First World War as the Third Balkan War. Most recently, Christopher Clark has focused on Eastern Europe uh, much more in his famous book, The Sleepwalkers. Um, but again, here it focuses very much on violence between armies or international relations. But we need to focus, I think, much more on violence against civilians. And there was a lot of it during the First World War as well. Very quick recap, 23rd of January 1913, the uh, Committee of Union and Progress seizes power in a coup d'etat. So far, we've s this, um, the hackneyed idea is that there was a triumvirate, Enver, the three pashas, huh? uh, Enver, Jamal, and Talat. But if you study the political going back and forth in Istanbul during the war, what we see is um, an axis of tension between Enver Pasha and Talat Pasha. Talat in charge of the um, civilian wing of the, of the state and Enver in charge of the army and Ministry of War. Um, ideology, also extremely important. In the period, and I think this is a, a, a period in Ottoman history that has, uh, has not received the attention that it should, the period between the end of the Balkan Wars and the beginning of the First World War. Uh, we've waited long for Shukri Haniolo, for example, to write this third volume. Uh, we're still waiting for it. It would be great if we, could, if we would have a, a comprehensive study of this period, uh, because um, we see the rise of ethnic nationalism in this period, media, propaganda, censorship, uh, in public debate, we see a lot of ethnic nationalism, youth groups, political assassinations, etc. So on the one hand, we see a certain radicalization of politics, more political assassinations, uh, repression by the government, and on the other hand, we see ideological shifts from Ottomanism. Gradually the shift, or actually very rapidly, the shift is made from Ottomanism to ethnic Turkish nationalism, or for Muslim nationalism. Um, and then the war breaks out. And there are three major, uh, major battles in the war, as you know. Uh, we have Gallipoli, Sarakamish, and Dilman. Uh, the latter two, Sarakamish and Dilman, end up ca catastrophically for the Ottoman army. And the Eastern Front basically collapses. And uh, it exposes the, uh, um, this red line to uh, the occupation by the Russian army. I'll get to that in the third part uh, of my talk. Now, as these battles are lost, we see an increasing persecution of the Armenian civilians during, during the war. This is also an, a relatively ignored aspect of the Armenian genocide. We tend to begin 24 April, and from then on it was a mass killing, but the period during, between the outbreak of the war and April 1915, this is a very important period and uh, deserves more, uh, more attention, this kind of rising escalating uh, persecution of Armenians. Now, when I did my research in Istanbul in the archives, I, I, I noticed this. So I didn't start in April studying the telegrams, but I started in September, August 1914. And what you see is mounting persecution. All Armenian civil servants are uh, fired in, in some provinces. Armenian police officers are sacked. Uh, if you work in a fire department, they picked out the few Armenians that worked there. They were also uh, fired and on and on and on. Until, of course, the, um, well, the major mass killing and, and genocide uh, operation was put, in, uh, was put in effect. Now, what's important here, this is a map that, of course, you've seen, the demographic um, uh, distribution of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. What is interesting is that in this vast territory, most recently, Tanar Akcham published a very interesting chapter in his book, his recent book, uh, where he, I think, convincingly argues that um, th there was no organized insurrection, let alone any resistance of any significance in this period, in that period I just mentioned. I think that that's extremely, uh, extremely important. The government is not responding to an, an insurrection. Um, I'd like to run very briefly through uh, four or five of the major pillars of, of the genocide. Um, I'd like to emphasize here that very often my students, they will come up to me and say, well, professor, I'm interested in studying the Armenian massacre, or I'm interested in studying the Armenian deportations. And I say, well, that's wrong. It's not just deportations or just massacre. The genocide, of course, is a comprehensive policy uh, of various elements that gear into each other and together uh, produce this unintended and deliberate 
destruction pro process. It begins, of course, with the decapitation of the community, the arrest of 24 April 1915. It begins in Istanbul. It's studied um, the two aspects that are important. These, these are extremely systematic. Uh, many memoirs speak of gendarmes showing up at a door with lists and che checking boxes, um, checking people off lists. And they're also, secondly, very fast. So in a matter of weeks, three, four weeks, the entire elite is arrested and about to be executed. Another interesting issue is, here's Krikor Zohrab, I would say a left liberal, maybe uh, secular, if not atheist, intellectual, and then we have the Bishop of Malatya, Mikhail Khachadrian. Now, what do these men have in common that they have to be arrested uh, and incarcerated together, and ultimately also killed? Because nothing else than that they were, the government perceived them as being part of a uh, elaborate conspiracy of the Armenian uprising, which didn't exist. Then we have the deportations, of course. The, there is, contrary to uh, popular belief, there is one extremely clear and explicit document in the Ottoman archives that, um, to me, demonstrates the organized and premeditated nature uh, of these massacres, uh, of the, uh, the deportations, sorry. And that is a telegram sent on the 23rd of May, 1915, to all provinces with the exception of two. One was Diyarbakir, which I've studied, and I never un really understood why Diyarbakir was not in this, in this list. Uh, and this, uh, the, uh, the second one is Aleppo. And these two uh, provinces uh, also should be studied separately. Uh, what was the, the logic of these deportations? It was like cleaning a room. So you start outside, you start at the, 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 the northernmost tip of the empire, and then you gradually work your way down. So they started in Trabzon, started in Erzurum at the front, and gradually moved into, uh, into Urfa, which was hit in 1916. Uh, also very clear logic. Now, expropriation tends to be seen as an economic policy or an economic process, but um, taking property or uh, confiscating property and land from a community also severely disempowers them. Uh, so it must be studied as an aspect of uh, the destruction policy. Now, the government, the Young Turk government issued three decrees and confiscated up to 41,000 buildings from the Armenian community. Now, we study this in this book, in Confiscation and Destruction. We have uh, two chapters in it on case studies, one on Adana and one on Diyarbakir. Uh, and something really interesting happened, actually. I'll tell this as a personal anecdote. We published a book, and a couple of months later, a common um, acquaintance of ours, of, of me and Mehmet, in Istanbul contacted us, and she said that the grand grandson of one of the major organizers of the genocide in Diyarbakir was looking for us. So I said, yeah, sure, maybe he's, he wants to talk. Uh, why not? Uh, and this is um, a man by the name of Ceylan Pirinciolo. And the Pirinciolo dynasty is a major powerful family in Diyarbakir. We're uh, severely, heavily involved in the genocide, the organization of the genocide. So we said, sure, the person can email us, so you can uh, contact us. But well, so very soon we found out that this was not for intellectual reasons, but uh, he was accusing us of, of defamation of his grandfather. And of course, there's no evidence that, uh, to, to, back up, uh, to back up his claim, but uh, this man is running the most uh, successful tour operator uh, in Turkey, and viptourism.com, uh, you can take a look at that. So, of course, you know, there's a certain preemptive, preemptive, uh, you know, uh, assault against uh, restitution, I think. But the evidence is, uh, unfortunately, too strong of that family's involvement in the genocide. Um, mass murder, of course, as the persecutions escalate, you know, one after the other taboo is broken, the escalating an expanding scope of the genocide, we see a mass murder operation uh, carried out by the special organization, Teshkilata Masulsa. There are, to my knowledge, uh, no photos of this group. This is one that I, uh, that I found in a war magazine published during the war. And the, of course, the Ottoman government, uh, back then also, but also in, in, in later versions of denial, was argued that these groups, yeah, there were chetas and gangs, they operated on their own behalf. Uh, Okay, but why is it that they're standing in front of the Ottoman War Ministry 
uh, if that's the case. And on this photo, you can clearly uh, see that. And Mudafai Milia Jamiat Leri were also uh, influential in, uh, in training these, mostly ideological training. If you look at these men very carefully, you see that they're also uh, drawn from a very broad age range. So uh, some of these men, they look like they're in their late 50s or 60s. Even. Uh, that's also quite interesting. Unfit for the war, for the regular service. Uh, so therefore, they slid off into paramilitary uh, service and uh, had to simply organize or commit the genocide. And in the Armenian genocide too, we see forced assimilation, forced conversion. This is an interesting, hotly contested. I, uh, one of your previous lectures was on this. I think it was, uh, was, it, was it Tallinn Sujian? I forgot. Tallinn not Moscow. Yeah. yeah. So th this is a very interesting kind of subject that's recently gained a lot of uh, attention in the past decade in Turkey after the publication of Fethiye Çetin's book. On the one hand, I agree with colleagues who argue that this is a functional part of the genocide, of er eradicating uh, organized social life, I mean social life by separating not only uh, parents from their children, but also spouses from each other and even siblings from each other. So this is the essence of what genocide is. So it's a certain sociological destruction uh, of, the, uh, of the family unit. And they must be treated much as the Argentinian uh, disappeared during the 1970s. Uh, you see this war against, um, um, uh, against families. Uh, I agree with that. But on the other hand, you also see that a lot of people well, quite a number of Armenians, they convert uh, in order to escape, uh, escape the genocide. So f physically survive, uh, but culturally do not. It's an interesting, ambiguous uh, story that needs to be, that, need, that deserves its own monog uh, monograph, I think. And I hope that that will be published very, time, uh, very soon. Um, finally, famine crime. Famine tends to be seen as kind of natural disaster. There was a drought. Uh, we couldn't feed our people. Uh, this is nonsense. 80% of famines are political, either as a crime of omission, the government is unable to uh, deliver because of corruption, because of other forms of uh, uh, ineptitude. But in this case, we see a crime of commission. So the young Turk government actually sealed off the territory where Armenians were, were, uh, uh, were concentrated in Derzor, the countryside of, um, of, um, of Aleppo. And, and created an ethnic hierarchy of food. So the Turks, the Turkish government officials or gendarmerie living in that province were allowed um, several hundred grams of bread every day. Under that, we had the Arab population and all the way at the bottom, we see the Armenians are bereft uh, of nutrition. So this, again, on a comparative note, uh, reminds us of Stalin's treatment of Ukraine, 1932-1933, on a completely different scale, of course. Uh, but uh, I think analytically similar. And the Armenian Genocide too, finally, we see a destruction of material culture on, a, on an unimaginable scale. If during the genocide already, we see that the government has these, these commandos that, that travel from town to town to make sure that they register and in many cases destroy uh, monasteries, uh, 2,500 of them uh, approximately. And in the 1970s, there was a, uh, a German archaeological mission that traveled around in Turkey and tried to find these, these monasteries. And as you can see, uh, this one is, uh, was wiped off the face of the earth. Now, when I was doing my research in the Republican archives in Ankara, I found a very interesting file. It, I wasn't looking for it. I was in the Ministry of Culture archives. And I, I found a rather thick file that had a it was almost an encyclopedic uh, compendium of all Armenian churches and monasteries, registered by the government in what state they were, whether they had inscriptions on it or not, etc. So that to me really clearly done, demonstrates, that, well, it suggests in any case, that there's a policy of uh, destruction of material culture. Okay, I have uh, two puzzles about the genocide I'd like to present and then move on to my final section, if that's okay. The first one is, we see a certain racialization of Armenian identity during the genocide. The genocide begins with the elites. It's then expanded to all Armenian men, apostolic men, uh, and then to women and children as well. And so each of these three concentric circles already is, can be called genocidal because of the categoric nature of the killing. 
And then in 1916-17, the government starts experimenting with Catholic Armenians, with Protestant Armenians, and in 1917 also with those who had converted to Islam to escape the genocide. So then we see sort of tracking down of what was still possible in 1915 to convert. Convert, shut up, and you'll be fine. But in 1915, they changed their minds. Sorry, in 1917, the government changed its mind and tracked down uh, a lot of these people and um, ultimately still included them in the, uh, the genocidal process. There are many, many anecdotes also of, uh, of the survivors, children of survivors that I spoke uh, in, in Syria, but also in Turkey, uh, that give examples of, of people who survived in the first instance, but then later in 1917-18 were still tracked down, uh, traced down and, and killed. The second puzzle, I think, is the most interesting problem in the historiography of the genocide. If you'd like to take a look at this uh, map with me, this map is a, um, is a breakdown of the results of the genocide per province. This is published by Ara Sarafian uh, from London. And what he's done is very simply look at the uh, d distribution. So black in these pie charts, black is the number of Armenians, the percentage of Armenians that were killed in the province, uh, virtually no deportations. Uh, dark gray is the number of Armenians that were deported from their original homeland, original hometowns, but they were still alive in another province, 1917. 1918. And light gray is the number of Armenians that were not deported at all until 1917. Now what we notice here, of course, very clearly, is there are differences, and there are significant differences also. And the question would be, how can we explain these small and large differences? I think the first one would be, of course, the disparity between East and West. The closer to the Russian front, the higher the number uh, of, of killings. But also, even, even if there is, if there are provinces that are relatively close to each other, away from the front, we see disparity. How is it possible that in Adana, a province that has seen so much killing in 1909, 24%, almost a quarter of Armenians were never deported in 1917? This is extremely puzzling, I think. How can we explain these, these provincial differences? In other cases, they, other provinces, you see the differences are even larger. Now, I, I, study, I worked on the trying an explanation of this. Uh, if there's one side project I'd like to work on is this one, uh, an explanation of the differential results, outcome of the genocide. And uh, there are at least about 24 to 25 factors that you can study uh, to explain these differential outcomes. Behavior of the perpetrators, uh, social economic uh, differences in the province, levels of collaborations and rescue, geographic conditions, etc., etc. There's almost two dozen factors. And that needs to be done for a general overview of the genocide. Okay, this brings me to my last part, last part of my, of my talk. Mm. So far, so good. 1918, the uh, Ottoman fronts collapse, and uh, there's the armistice. But of course, the war doesn't end there. We see that there are what I'd like to call three more wars. The Russian occupation, 1917, runs into 1918. The Ottoman occupation of the uh, South Caucasus, and of course the Greco-Armeno-Turkish Wars. Studied, of course, rather separately because of the foundational myth of the Turkish Republic, focuses on the Greco-Turkish War especially, because that's the only one that can be considered to have, to have been won, more or less. Now, what happens in the first phase? the Russian occupation, this, this, this area more or less. And the Russians, first and foremost, they document the genocide. Peter Holquist, I think, has also spoken here. He has studied the files. Uh, I've also looked at some of the memoirs. Uh, for example, uh, a Russian writer by the name of Viktor Shklovsky uh, has, has written extensively about his encounters in this period, uh, in this region. And there are also some photos in military magazines. Russia. Russian army uh, in completely different provinces and regions, from Trabzon all the way down to Bitlis, they encounter uh, mass graves, extremely fresh uh, uh, mass graves. For example, this one, uh, this one is from a, uh, a Russian military magazine, uh, 1916, in a church in Mush, where clearly people have been driven together and 
uh, and killed. Um, we need more research on that as well, on the Russian engagement with, uh, with also the civilian populations. Now, the second important thing that happens here is that, of course, there is some, Ar some Armenian paramilitary uh, activity in this period. We see some acts, individual and some organized, of revenge and a certain attempt, uh, half-hearted, to establish uh, an Armenia. Now, this, these acts have been relatively well documented, um, but we, I think we need to liberate the, those acts in, in the period of, uh, of, of revenge acts. We need to liberate it from the suffocating hold that especially uh, a Turkish nationalist propaganda has over these periods. And treating it as a taboo, I think, um, is, is not terribly helpful because it can uh, elucidate processes of violence uh, in this period and also later. Uh, the Russian army had a major ethnic security problem in this area. Virtually a, a civil war between uh, Armenian military and paramilitary groups and the uh, Kurdish tribes. So if you read these Russian memoirs, they all talk about trying to keep these groups apart uh, so that they not uh, engage in a full-on civil war. Um, we, we see uh, a Kurdish tribal activity uh, against, uh, against Armenians. Of course, there's a lot of fear for, for justice and for revenge among many Kurdish tribes, such as, such as the Pinyanishi tribe, this tribe in, uh, in the area of Ararat, uh, that, were, that collaborated in the genocide. So that's one, one uh, phase. The second phase is when we shift from this, period, from this region to, to this one, and also a certain seamless transition. The Russian Civil War happens, and the narrative of the Russian Civil War is mostly confined to scholars of, of Russian history. Right? So they, to, they tend to do the, the Caucasus, the Russian things, the Ottomanists tend to do the Ottoman thing, but we see a seamless transition of human beings, peoples and groups moving across boundaries um, and this needs to be uh, examined, I think, in a comparative, comparative way. Um, we see a direct Ottoman occupation of, uh, of, of this region, of Armenian, what is now Armenian Azerbaijan, the South Caucasus, and attracted by the oil fields uh, of Azerbaijan, and probably to a much lesser extent ideology of pan-Turkism, according to Michael Reynolds, uh, the, the young Turks invaded the South Caucasus and marched on Baku. Uh, the two men that were responsible for these, uh, these campaigns were Halil Pasha and Nuri Pasha. Halil Pasha was the uncle of Enver Pasha, even though he was one year younger. Uh, he commanded the Ottoman forces uh, in Qutal Amara in, uh, in Iraq, capturing General Townshend. And for him, this is also important, for him the Great War, the First World War, was not a war between states. It was a war between nations. If you read his memoirs, we read uh, his uh, and expressions and commentary on his on his character and his conduct of the war um, the, it was a war between nations so he is the man who interestingly uh, allegedly said I quote I have tried to destroy the Armenian nation up to the last person end of quote uh, that's rather ominous I think and Nuri Pasha was the brother of Enver Pasha and what we know about him is that he, that he was a true pan-Turkist who uh, believed in certain unification with Azerbaijan um, and his, uh, in September 1918, his combined Ottoman Azeri uh, army stormed Baku and upon entering, uh, hunted down Armenians and killed them indiscriminately. So we see a certain back and forth of killing against civilians particularly, no longer defeating armies, but attacks on civilian populations particularly. After the war, he lived in Russia and in Germany and he opened an arms factory. Um, Here's a picture of, of, of the killings in Baku. And this is not even all of it. There's a series of wars going on. Richard Hovhannisyan uh, has studied these in his uh, the famous trilogy uh, on, 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 on the Republic of Armenia. Uh, but that's basically the last research that we have of it so far. I think we need to uh, expose this much more. Michael Reynolds has done some studies on this. Karabakh, on Zangezur, and on Baku. Now, finally, and then I've spoken way too much, uh, the Greco-Turkish and on the other side, the Armeno-Turkish War. The Greek occupation of the Ottoman Empire sparked the Greco-Turkish War. Of also, very interestingly, as soon as the Greeks occupied Smyrna in this, these territories, the first assaults are against the civilian population. 
almost similarly to Salonika, almost as if nothing changed. I mean, this could have been the fourth Balkan Wars. Um, and then, of course, the narrative in, in Turkey, by you know, some of the, uh, the Turkish official histories, is that this, you know, this was a kind of uh, millenarian struggle for, 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 you know, struggle for history, an existential struggle. But if you study in a dispassionate way the acts of violence committed, the four or five elements that I mentioned from the Balkan Wars, they reappear almost in an identical way uh, in uh, this period, even though it was a different government in, in Greece. Okay, some conclusions. Um, how are these three periods related to each other? I don't have all the answers, but I'd like to suggest at least a few lines or directions of analysis. First of all, the transformation of the war. We see a very clear brutalization of war. Very long transportation lines, mass death because of disease, and frustration and also disillusion with the war. As there's a very clear uh, uh, emotive aspect, a pr uh, emotive process to the war, which of course in Western Europe was four years, but with the Ottomans we're dealing with a decade of war. Secondly, we see ambitious or over-ambitious generals uh, who were, to borrow from Stalin's vocabulary, dizzy with success. And this man Dimitriev that I mentioned is only one, but of course Halil Pasha could just, um, uh, could just figure in that pantheon. And then the, uh, the Balkan Wars also saw this, what I like to call the Ottoman Dorstos Legenda. So, the, you know, the stab in the back, the, the myth of the Christians who stabbed us in the back as a part of the general discourse of treason and disloyalty. Very crude generalization, scapegoating all Ottoman Christians uh, who backstabbed the army. A against very clear evidence to the contrary, there are ab about 10 times as many Armenians fighting in the Ottoman army during Balkan Wars, then the 230 men Antranik had under his command uh, in, in, on the Balkan side, in the Bulgarian army. Um, groups were singled out, and I think one of the important points here is that also the vulnerability of the groups contributed to them being, being victimized. Because they have no state or army to retaliate. Secondly, territorial obsessions. Some of the nations, or the national myths uh, produced in this period, um, revolve around certain mythical, almost mystical territory. So for the Serbs, this has always been Kosovo. Uh, 1389 or 1989, uh, journalists doing research on the, the most recent Balkan Yugoslavia wars, they argue that they couldn't even tell the difference anymore what the, what the Serbs were talking about. The Sanjak region in southern Serbia, the same thing. This obsession with Sanjak must be uh, Serbian. Macedonia, I mean, Need I say more? The conflicts between Yugoslavia uh, and Greece up to now. Edirne as the Ottoman capital cannot fall, must fall. So we see a certain Stalingrad effect there. It's an obsession with certain, certain territories. And Karabakh, uh, this, you know, this problem begins, of course, back then, not just with the, uh, with the Soviet uh, rezoning. And Baku, of course, as a city, uh, the capital of Azerbaijan, which, where the Azeris were the minority. Um, somewhat related to this, these obsessions, uh, this ideological utopias. We know that uh, extreme ideologies give rise to forms of uh, extreme violence. So the Megali idea, for example, the, the idea of united, uh, free, independent uh, uh, Armenia. The, the dream of Ottomanism that turned into a nightmare or dystopia uh, of Turkish nationalism, Turkish ethnic uh, uh, nationalism and the almost eternal Serbian obsession with a broader, greater Serbia, which resurfaced in all four, Ser all four wars that the Serbs fought in the 20th century. And then war, of course, also as nation formation. Right? These concentric circles that I mentioned, the war also shaped um, the nation formation process because it defined the racial and the spatial locations of the nation. Not only for the perpetrator nation, for, for the Turks, but also for the victim uh, group. In a way, you could argue that Talat Pasha was, one, was an Armenian nationalist because he saw uh, Armenians primarily through the, uh, the prism of ethnicity. And finally, the transposition and brutalization of political cultures. So this is the, the, you know, the major question, how did these conflicts influence each other? Is it only because people moved from one conflict to the other? Or do we also see a certain political culture that um, violence that traveled 
from the Balkans to Anatolia into the Caucasus. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Professor Balak. Uh, you said that there was tension between Talat and India. I've always questioned the claim that Bhanka was Jamal also as almost equally important. I don't think so, but I'd like to know what you think. But I always thought that uh, Talat, since he had no military base, you know, in order for him to stay in power, he had to be on the terms with with Kenya. And perhaps I'm mistaken, but during the Little and there was of course uh, unhappy with, with the successes of uh, Jamal, and there was tension between them. And I think. If I'm not mistaken, Tala uh, sided with Henry. Does this say something about uh, mm -hmm. the importance of Hamdars to Tala because he had the army, Hamdar had his base, he was secure, whereas Tala had only uh, had no such base mm -hmm. and he had to rely on Hamdar. Yeah, I think um, I think that makes uh, perfect sense. I mean, I wouldn't see I. I haven't seen any evidence of Talat undermining Enver through his connections in, uh, in the army. There, there were very few, if any. Uh, what we do see in the Ottoman army is a certain patrimonialism. So not just loyalty to the Ottoman flag or to the, uh, to the country, but a certain, a certain groupism. You would have uh, Enver Pasha and Adamlaru, so Enver Pasha's men, and then you would have Jamal Pasha's men. So the, the, a very intricate uh, systems and structures um, of um, uh, patrimonialism and um, patron-client relations. And it would be extremely dangerous for Tala to undermine Enver doing that because uh, he might, uh, that, would have that could have caused Enver to purify the Ottoman army even more, to eliminate any and all of Jamal Pasha's men, including, which, uh, including Mustafa Kemal, who also belonged to one of these groups. Uh, and to undermine it because it would only expose, it would give Enver an excellent op opportunity to purify the army even more uh, and to establish a near hegemony in the army. Now, I, I also agree with you when, if you say that, well, Talat had no military backing, he had no army, that's true. But he had the paramilitaries. So he had Bahatin Shakir right, right under him and he had Dr. Mehmet Nazim right under him and these Bahatin Shakir commanded the uh, paramilitary formations uh, and these men were to be reckoned with. Yeah, so they were equally ruthless, mostly drawn from the, the, the networks of organized crime, uh, ruthless enough to carry out political assassinations and executions. And of course, some of these were hanged by Jamal Pasha. So the idea also that the Young Turk dictatorship, which I, I, it is a dictatorship, is a kind of well-shaped, oil, well-oiled machine as a Moloch that works perfectly that's not how dictatorships work in general, and certainly also not the Young Turk dictatorship. There's enormous intrigues. The way that they intimidate each other, Enver Pasha picks up Talat Pasha from his house one morning in his car, for example, and uh, he says, uh, he shows him a gun. He says, look at this beautiful gun that I have. Do you like it? Why are you showing me this? You know, so th th you see these men also threatening each other, uh, not always doing each other all the favors, and especially when it came to requisitioning, so uh, logistical support, they had completely different interests here. Enver needed to support the army. For that, some Armenians need to be kept alive. Talat had completely different objectives. For him, the destruction of the Armenian civilian population was priority. So also in that regard, they even clashed. Mm -hmm. yeah, so in the recent discussions we saw on Torosyan, and Sarkis Torosyan, they can be explained, I think, by looking at these, these intrigues. Why is it that some Armenian soldiers and even uh, of, uh, officers are still alive deep into 1917. It is because they had some patronage by, by Talat. Got, got you, you just talked a, a really interesting, intriguing term in, 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 in this, this very detailed response to it. 
product, and that was organized crime. Um, what does that figure into the, this, this set of phenomena and, and, um, and, and, and factors who are those ball controllers? <coughs> it's been a while since I had a sort of quick glance at that dry engine dress. This is more cool. Yeah. Who, um, brings that, that factor out to consider. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious what, what you make it, and, and what does organized crime mean in this, this context of the, this, these worst situations? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a very good question. Let me start by saying that and then gain some time for myself to respond to this, uh, to this question. Um, I think um, in, in at least two ways organized crime plays, plays a role in, uh, in, in, the, in the process of the, you know, the genocide of the war in general. First of all, that what we see is people who were arrested for non-political violence, uh, robbery, smuggling, uh, assassinations, some people were hit men, that they were hired by the special organization, yeah, that the prisons were opened, quote unquote. Some of these men are drafted from, uh, from existing organized crime networks. Organized crime exists in all societies, or mostly for prohibited substances or uh, for pr prostitution, for example, services that are illegal. Uh, that existed in the Ottoman Empire too. And you see that these men are drafted. So that's one thing. So the, by taking this decision, by drafting these men from the pool of organized crime, they, the Young Turk regime also criminalizes the war. So these men were involved in what we see in many memoirs, not because they hated the Armenians so much or because they loved the Turkish nation so much, but for private gain. And so they start robbing. Confiscation policy becomes a fantastic opportunity to enrich yourself, and many of them actually are. And in those cases, very interestingly, where we see telegrams from Talat Pasha to the provinces. This man should be arrested for robbing the Armenians. And so the government would now show us that document. See, we didn't, we didn't do anything. But no, it's not because he's robbing the Armenians, but he's robbing them for his own gain. The property should go to the Turkish settlers that came in from the Balkans and for no other reason. That's one, re that's one part of, of the equation, I think. And the second one uh, is um, that we see that the, uh, and this is also a point that King Garris touches upon, not only that organized crime exists and that it, it criminalizes the war, but that the war itself is a fantastic opportunity for crime. Because as I showed in the third part of my, of my talk, there are, there are lapses of the front. And so the, the, the sometimes there's no man's land. The Russian army retreats, the Ottoman army attacks, back and forth, back and forth. And in these periods of lawlessness, we see that the, the crime actually um, um, uh, flourishes. And this is, of course, the case in, in, all, in, all, uh, uh, in, all, in all civil wars, especially, we see that. Smuggling becomes a major issue. Uh, other services. People start settling scores, completely private scores. So apart from this kind of high, high-level political ideological struggles, we also have these micro problems, private issues. Um, families, for example, who clash with each other. I'll give an example. Um, when we study the confiscation documents, right, so what happens after the Armenians are, are expropriated? It's one process, the taking, and then the giving all this property to the ordinary Turks. Very interesting process. Um, there were clear lists of people to be advantaged, who was supposed to be given the property. Um, and these were people who played an important role in the genocide. Right? If you made yourself useful in the genocide, you were rewarded. With, with property. Now, in um, one of the villages near Adana, cotton producing uh, village, we see a, a large farm with cotton fields. And the government has not decided or has, they simply forgot or there was a glitch. They did not assign that farm particularly to, to one family or to a merchant. And what we see is that two families started vying for this property. One occupied it preemptively and they said, this is ours, we've landed on it now. Another one came in and said, now, well, wait a minute. Uh, and they write to the Turkish government. They say, look, we have the right to this property because it was us who killed the people who used to live here. So technically, we, we have earned this. Yeah? Um, what happens then, of course, these people start killing each other. Yeah? So what you see is assassinations back and forth, back and forth, vendetta style, until the Ottoman army has to 
move the gendarmerie has to move in. Guys, please stop this, this, this nonsense. Uh, we see that the, the war and the genocide itself also breeds um, the cri crime, violent crime, in, in other cases, nonviolent property crime. How exactly it works, but this is only two parts of the uh, how exactly it worked and also from then on, I'm not so sure. Well, I've spoken once with Gingaris who argued that those groups who became rich in the genocide later became the major mafia bosses in Turkey. Yeah. It's an interesting hypothesis. We can uh, examine that as well. Yeah, no, you, I think he's coming soon. Good. Thank you. So I was wondering if it, you could talk to us a little bit about your access to archives mm -hmm. um, in Turkey. Yeah. Um, so the official archives, but also something that you're trying to do as far as erasures of voices and yeah. extermination, also oral interviews that you are using to try to get away from this top-down um, narration of yeah. uh, the genocide itself. Mm -hmm. So two aspects. Yeah. So Official archives, the archives and then oral. And then the bottom one. Yeah. Mm, during, uh, during my research in Turkey, and I spent about three full summers um, uh, interviewing uh, seniors in, in Eastern Turkey. Um, it was a very interesting experience because I'd expected to go into these villages and these towns. In some cases, these people were living in Istanbul. Um, of course, interviews with Armenian survivors have been done. Uh, there's a collection UCLA, Zorian Institute has a very interesting collection. Uh, you can look at those. I've also done one or two interviews with especially Diyarbakir Armenians. But what was so surprising to me when I, w when I went to Turkey and I did, research, did, I did this oral history research, I interviewed and everybody was so open about the genocide. I have, of all the, the elderly, mostly 70 up, or let's say 80 up, uh, whose parents had witnessed the genocide and told them about it, there was virtually no denial of the genocide. Or there was cognitive dissonance. They would say, the Armenians are all lying, but my father saw that they were all killed in my village. So, I mean, that, that doesn't really fit. But most of the time, they were quite open about it. And um, you don't even have to necessarily ask about it. In some cases, I spoke to an old man in uh, Sivas, and he would simply walk me in his village, and he would say, look, this house, belongs to Sarkis Efendi. He was killed with his family right on that bridge over there. Uh, oh, this house belongs to Nishan Efendi. Oh, he was killed over there with his So these details are vividly remembered. And I, I agree, research should be done on, uh, I mean, converts, people like Fethiye Chetin, but the voices of the children of the perpetrators also need to be uh, recorded because we're so open about it. Um, and if there's really one project that I'd like to do, if I would win the lottery tomorrow for a million dollars, I would carry out a project like that. Uh, 10, 12 graduate students, send them out to particular regions, and then interview. And you can do hundreds, possibly thousands of interviews of, uh, where the local knowledge is very strong, detailed local knowledge. And secondly, the so these sources, these people, they all corroborate each other. So I mean, what better answer to to the denial would there be if you uh, if you uh, record these sources? Archival research. When I did my first archival research, 2005, which I can't believe is almost 10 years ago, um, the access in Istanbul at the Başbakan Cumhuriyet Archive was pretty good. Not everything had been uh, disclosed yet. I had the feeling they were a little bit sluggish, though. Of course, the number of documents you can get. But they, I, I don't understand why they cannot digitize large numbers. I mean, the Dutch uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example, had, had digitized their Indonesia archive within a matter of months. And that's thousands of, thousands of documents. It's not that hard. Okay, let's accept that for a minute. There are three, ar three archives that are closed, and there's no inclination of them opening up anytime soon. But they are s extremely important to a study of the violence in this period in general, the war, but also the genocide. And that is, of course, the military archives in, Istanbul, in uh, Ankara, sorry, Atase, which is virtually impossible to get access to, very little Sisyphean process. Secondly, the property archives. We, we wrote to the, uh, to the person in charge of the archives, and he said, uh, we have no archive. 
yeah, which is a very Soviet way of responding to, uh, to you know, to archival inquiry, I think. Um, and the third, uh, very important, because you know, those registers have exact details on what property was taken from which family, when, and also even worse, given to whom, right? So this is a Pandora's box. Uh, I, in my wildest dreams, I do research in those archives, and then I wake up in sweat and thinking this is not going to fly. Um, the third important body of knowledge is provincial archives. I, I think I was speaking with, uh, with Professor Baradakjan about this uh, previously. Um, where are the provincial archives in Turkey? If everything is concentrated in Istanbul, where, where are the files of the province of Adana, for example? The governor has an office. And he, uh, he corresponds back and forth. He takes petitions. He registers them. Is everything uh, uh, concentrated in, in Istanbul? I don't think so. We have one colleague, um, Toxas was her last name, uh, who um, she did research in, in archives in Adana. But it's, 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 it's a real mystery. It's a real mystery to me where these, uh, where these files be, because they would give this kind of detailed case study that we need as well. Yeah. You, you also mentioned that they happened, um, yeah, right. so um, as forced assimilation. Mm -hmm. So one question is that how should we understand assimilation at the time of war? Mm -hmm. So um, um, what is your definition of assimilation? Mm -hmm. Assimilation into what? Right. So, um, and the other one is um, more of a comment maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so like Petty and Chetin's approach to yeah. the conversation like one approach that can like, um, understand um, com how conversions happened. So um, basically, she's like, she's basing her um, argument on, on her family story, which mm -hmm. is like a very limited um, understanding of how conversions yeah. happened. And she's, she's like, that understanding also argues that um, it was women and individual cases, but we know that villages also converted. Mm -hmm. uh, voluntarily, mm -hmm. right? So the second question, based on that comment, is that how do we, how can we differentiate between forced and voluntary conflict mm -hmm. at the time of the What what makes that possible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good, uh, well, very good questions uh, that need to be resolved. And, um, how do I how do I understand forced assimilation? I think the intention, if you read the uh, several hundreds of orders and documents from Istanbul on this, you know this. Um, th these policies of uh, assimilation, then there are th the major, I think, revelation to me is that the government had a relatively good sociological vision. So they did not expect people to convert. You know, you change your name to, to a Muslim name. Uh, for, the, for the men, you know, you have to simply recite the shahada. And for the women, you have to change your name. And then the next day, you've completely forgotten about everything that happened before. Of course, this is not the way the government envisioned it at all. Uh, they had a pretty realistic, I think, sociologically realistic vision of forced assimilation. You break people up, you make sure that the families are separated. Otherwise, the emotional ties will be too strong. People start looking for their families, and they start speaking Armenian again. God forbid, they start coming together on a larger scale, and then you have the community again, which you try to break up so much. Uh, so for the government, for the Young Turk government, this was a long-term process. They said this is going to take time. One generation, maybe two generations. And there is a certain, in these documents, there is a certain awareness that people's identities don't, don't change overnight. And I think that that's quite realistic. And some have argued, some colleagues have argued this is because of Zia Gökalp's uh, influence of sociological thinking, nurture over nature, uh, that has influenced. It. I haven't seen any evidence of it because they don't, they don't refer to it anywhere. Um, so, to me, uh, the government's definition, the Young Turk government's definition, is entirely realistic. And so, only over a matter of generations, if the silences are upkept, and they're not, of course. Uh, ultimately, in the case of Fethiye Çetin, they're not. But there are also many others there that are actually uh, people who walk around and don't know, uh, don't have a certain awareness of uh, of, of ethnic identity. Um, 
that's one aspect, the sociological. The second one is cultural. Uh, it's a forced cultural assimilation, of course. Changing people's names, change, changing village names, uh, and then uh, not allowing them anymore to speak their own language. So that was already important. Not allowing them anymore to carry out their ethnic markers. So no more uh, Christianity. That was important. Not because they're necessarily, they were also secular, the young Turks, but also because Christianity was a part of ethnic identity. And that ethnic identity had to be, had to be broken up. Not very different from the way the young Turk government treated the Kurds in this period. Uh, if you compare the policy of the Armenians versus the Armenians versus that um, against the Kurds, we see a similar two-track. Eradication of religion, also for the Kurds, because in the madrasas, they would speak Kurdish and they would uh, teach in Kurdish. Uh, and um, the, for example, the Naqshbandi order, uh, heavily Kurdish, of course, people like Sheikh Said. Um, there too, we see a certain awareness of breaking up sociologically, sending people isolated to certain villages on the other side of the country, uh, prohibiting the culture and prohibiting the language. So these are, the, I think, three elements of, of forced assimilation. And then the, your second question, I forgot, sorry. Forced and voluntary. Uh, oof, I, I don't know. I think voluntary assimilation that, um, with coercion in the background, uh, with this, this war looming, or with the persecution looming. Not to mention the example of people who have not converted or assimilated. I think that um, there is no voluntary assimilation. I think there are only uh, grades of force and coercion. Some of them less, people who would in the beginning of the genocide, step up, okay, I'll convert, but just leave me alone after that. Or people who much later, after they lost all their family, as a last resort, they might think, okay, uh, in, Alep, in, uh, in, uh, in Aleppo, I'll see a, an imam and I'll convert. Uh, and then people all the way at the end were forcibly circumcised, for example, you see all this, also a form of sexual violence, of course. Uh, so there, I, think, I don't think that there's such a thing as voluntary. Uh, conversion, I, at least not in this period. There's simply too much violence or um, threat of violence on, this on these communities for these conversions to be really called voluntary. And they had an in immense impact also in, uh, you know, in the silences, of course. I mean, I'm, you know, you've studied this literature. I was in particular not, not really interested, but as a, another spin-off of my, of my book, I, um, I published an article about it once. Uh, it was all based on an encounter I had really bizarre <laughs> encounter I had in, this is in Kayseri, and I was visiting a friend of mine, and he took me around town. Um, sorry, this was in Ereili, Konya Ereili. Small, br breezy, but sleepy town. And I visited him, I said, no research for a few days, just relaxing. And we're walking, you know, on the main street, and then there's this friend of his, this uh, man in his 60s, Fikret, Fikret Amja. So Uncle Fikret, we, you know, we walk up to him, we say, hi, how's it going? And he said, well, not too well, actually. I said, I'm sorry, what, what happened? He said, well, my father is uh, very ill, and I'm just afraid he's going to die. And I said, we're very sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. And, and then he says, you know, I'm not sad that he's going to die because he's been sick for a long time. I'm just very sad that he refuses to recite the shahada before he dies. And we just, it was an extremely bizarre moment. We looked at each other's eyes for like four seconds. We fully understood each other, and then we parted. And it's an extremely telling anecdote how this man, at the age of 60, 62, finds out that his father was an Armenian. So 62 years of secrecy, I think, um, uh, does not suggest that this man converted out of voluntary free will. Uh, the symbolic violence behind it is simply, simply too much. How's that? Uh, I have a brief question. Did you see any difference uh, of the Ottoman army attitude towards the Ottoman Empire when they exercise communism? And if you do see any difference, how do you explain it? Mm -hmm. So, uh, is there a difference uh, the way that the Ottoman army treats Armenians in the Ottoman Empire? During the war? And during the brief period when they captured the South Caucasus and establishment of its eastern part, captured Azerbaijan and. Yeah, yeah. 
not processing the same process, why are they not? Uh, is there any difference, uh, basically, is there a view of the Prometheus between, between the Ottoman Empire and the Prometheus between, between the Russian Empire? You see, this is, this is exactly the question that is at the root of this whole research project. Uh, the transposition of political cultures. Uh, because if that's true, you know, if, if, uh, if your hypothesis is correct, if we answer yes, that means that th this is one of the main vectors of, of transfer, the transfer of perceptions of civilian populations from one region, completely different region to another. Um, tentatively, we have to study basically all of the political memoirs, we have to study the uh, military memoirs and also the way that the military communicated among themselves uh, in order to answer that question fully. What we know so far is that no, they did hardly distinguish between these, between these groups. My reading was, uh, because I can, I'm coming from the Russian Empire, yeah. from what I saw is uh, basically you see the difference. Do. So the Armenians from the Ottoman Empire are uh, really fearful of the uh, Ottoman army that is coming in. The Armenians who are Russian subjects are fearful but much less so. Mm -hmm. Uh, plus, when you start looking at the documents, uh, there is difference yeah. uh, of the treatment, especially of the Armenians who are under the control of the Ottoman army in Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Azerbaijan the, the Ottoman army would negotiate with the uh, Russian army, mm -hmm. but uh, the treatment would be completely different with regard to the uh, Ottoman army who escaped into the Russian yeah. territory. Okay. The Russian yeah. I, mean, uh, I was wondering. That's, uh, well, you know, it would simply be like, I think, if we look at the two men that I mentioned, uh, so Halil and Nuri Pasha, but there's only two of them, of course, we need to study much broader plethora. Um, Pasha himself, actually, when he comes to Karabakh, uh, there is very kind of contained violence, like very limited violence, so it's not uh, anything that resembles what would have happened. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, th th that's fascinating. I mean, I, the question is, why, why did they distinguish them? Did they feel that the Ottoman Armenians, that they betrayed the homeland by fleeing across the Russian borders? Which, of course, violence against refugees is a form of punishment. Uh, because, you know, if you flee, it's a, it's a comment on the regime itself rather than anything else. Uh, I, I would be interested in hearing more about that. Yeah. And also, what, how exactly was the difference carried out then in terms of, there was less violence or was it different violence or? Well, I mean, I, I never went into detail because I hmm. was Violence per se, just uh, what, what I was getting from the documents. Yeah. The working on my stuff. So, yeah. You know, one has to go and kind of find out. But that was my perception. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is how possible. It was seen from the yeah. Russian. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, it makes sense to some extent because the, 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 the Armenian memoirs we have, we, sorry, we do have, of uh, the refugees who fled across borders is that A, these people are not only uh, fearful. But also, there is a, consider a significant level of, of, of uh, vindictiveness uh, against the massacres being committed uh, in the Ottoman Empire. There's, uh, there's a very interesting memoir from Van to Detroit, I think it's called. Uh, I forgot the name, but the, in the, there are some very interesting. Also, Esmerian, for example, has written an interesting memoir. He, wor he worked under the paramilitary leader Murat, uh, Murat of Sebastia. And there we see, indeed, that these, because the, Armenian, the Ottoman armies, they know what the Young Turk regime is capable of, uh, but I wonder then, what, you know, how, how was that interaction then in Russian Armenia? Did the Russian Armenians, were they, did, were they incredulous? Did they think, I don't believe this, these atrocity propaganda? Or I mean, if, if that can help you, but say, for example, the violence in Baku wasn't perpetrated by the Ottoman forces, per se, it was yeah. perpetrated by the Azerbaijan forces. Of course, the yeah, yeah. Was, uh, the battle, and uh, the Azerbaijan forces went to this. Uh, yeah, and, and given impunity, of course, uh, the Ottoman is a context for. Uh, the Ottoman army laid siege to Baku, and let the locals do that. Yeah. Yeah. That was very well planned. Mm -hmm. Basically, when, uh, if I may, uh, you're saying that the quote unquote Eastern army and those of the Russian Empire were not as worried about the, uh, the Western army. I think um, there's very little truth to that because of the uh, uh, battles throughout the month of May 1918. Mm -hmm. That was all local Eastern Armenians that rose against the Turkish onslaught. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
So they knew uh, what to expect. I think so. uh, that, that makes a point as well. I mean, I'm convinced by both of your arguments in a way because in 1916 we already see, you know, these these propag not propaganda, quote unquote, you know, these these kind of photos are being published in uh, you know in Russian magazines already. So what was there still not to be believed about the Young Turk crime and crimes against uh, the Armenian civilian populations? It reminds me a little bit about how um, how uh, how Dutch Jews, for example, in the Second World War thought. You know, the Second World War is, we're going to sit it out just like the First World War. We'll be neutral. And all this propaganda of the Germans killing the Jews in Poland, we shouldn't believe it. Huh? This is a nation of Goethe and Schiller. Uh, nothing is going to happen to us. But, of course, the Polish Jews had intimate knowledge of, uh, of, of mass killings of civilians. Uh, but then there was very little communication between the two. Very little. And when the Dutch Jews, when they arrived finally by train in the, in the, you know, at, the, at the death camps, they walked out and they had no clue what they were getting into. But uh, it, it would be interesting, I think, <coughs> to, to, look at, to look at the interactions eh, between the two. For example, in this kind of uh, aspect, uh, the Ottoman uh, side uh, was not even negotiating with the Ottoman Union, even if there were no. cases of resistance. Exactly. But if you look at the South Caucasus, you have a number of uh, negotiations and even acknowledgement of just the very resistance of the Republican media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But that's in a way uh, kind of uh, introduces a certain dimension. Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, part. And then, then there is a situation in Karabakh. Karabakh is being integrated into Azerbaijan by the Ottoman troops, but uh, they don't attempt to exterminate the population in Karabakh. No. But is the British are there. No, but British are not there. Right. In you know, general. In general. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were aware of that. Right? Yeah. And yeah. Well, that's I mean, you know, these discussions exactly. I think they point out that uh, not only that more research is needed, but also what kind of research is needed. So I'd like to see exactly what you said: perceptions of the Ottoman army coming in. Uh, also discussions between uh, Ottoman Armenian refugees and Russian Armenians. I think that could clarify to, to some extent if it exactly is true that these conflicts are transposed from uh, Anatolia to the Caucasus. I think that's something else that I would spend a million dollars on. <laughs>